Good morning. Uh, it's a perfect summer's morning in London, and I, uh, I'm Lindsay Scott. I'm the CEO at 39 Essex Chambers, and I'm welcoming you all to this uh, webinar, 60-minute um, webinar hosted by 39 Essex Chambers. Uh, we are commercial, international commercial barristers uh, based in London, Singapore, and Malaysia. And we are jointly hosting with King and Wood Mallison, a leading international law firm headquartered in Asia. They, um, they help clients open doors and unlock opportunities as they look to Asian markets to unleash their full potential. They um, combine an unrivaled depth of expertise and breadth of relationships in their core markets and they are proud to connect Asia to the world and the world to Asia. Uh, we are um, very grateful to you all for joining us. Uh, we've got over 300 participants from all over the world, Sri Lanka, UK, Spain, Belgium, China, Singapore, Jordan, India, UAE, Australia, Hong Kong, Malaysia, USA. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you all very much for joining us. And I'm very sorry if I've missed any countries out. It feels like the Eurovision Song Contest. Um, so today we're going to be talking about uh, reaching the most effective outcome, managing arbitration disputes in the uh, time of CV19. Um, what does this mean? Well, for most commercial parties at the beginning of a project, it usually means making sure that the project is completed on time and on budget. But as we all know, this is often not the case, and particularly not at the moment with the disruption that's been caused by CV19. So where a dispute about this is unfortunately likely, how can it best be managed through arbitration to reach the most effective and efficient outcome for all the parties? So our four speakers today are looking at how to do this across the life cycle of an arbitration dispute. Um, uh, it's incipient stages when the parties agree to it in an arbitration clause, which James is going to be uh, speaking about. Uh, to the selection of counsel and arbitrators, which Fan is going to address, then to the arbitration itself, um, where Jonathan is going to talk about how to understand and use arbitration procedures. And then last but not least, Marion will discuss how to make hearings work best for the client, particularly in view of the disruptions caused by CV19 and the need for remote hearings. Um, so as you've heard, we've got four speakers. They're all going to speak for around 10 minutes each, maybe a bit less. And then they're going to take questions via the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. Um, please do uh, ask as many questions as you want and the speakers will try and answer them um, towards the end of the hour. Um, you can ask questions both in English and in Mandarin. So um, please do do that and we'll, we'll do the, the best job we can in answering all those questions. Uh, the um, webinar is going to be recorded and it will be available on the homepage of both our websites, so 39 Essex Chambers and King and Wood Mallison. Um, so I'm just going to introduce the speakers very quickly and I'm going to introduce them all at the same time so as not to stop the flow of the webinar um, and, then I'll, and then I'll let them get to it. So James, James McKenzie is an international arbitration and commercial litigation specialist with broad experience acting as both counsel and advocate in complex disputes with a particular focus on construction, infrastructure, resources and energy sector. Um, James has previously worked in the King and Wood Mallison's Hong Kong office before moving to London in late 2019 and then getting locked in. And he's qualified in both jurisdictions as well as in Australia. Uh, Dr. Fan Yang um, has, has been in uh, uh, London, but recently, very recently, escaped back to Hong Kong. So we're welcoming um, Fan from Hong Kong. Uh, she was uh, born in the People's Republic of China and has studied in uh, Shanghai, Paris, Birmingham, London. She's called to the Bar of England and Wales, and she's a member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and a fellow um, FCR in 2012. Um, her bio goes on and on and on and is very, very impressive. But currently, she's the International Dispute Resolution Manager at KWM and Director of the International Dispute Resolution Academy. So she's represented clients and arbitrated and mediated in English and Chinese languages. She specializes in complex commercial contracts, 
such as you know joint ventures, international sales of goods, letters of credit, character of goods by sea, construction contracts, and in English law, Hong Kong law, and mainland Chinese law. Jonathan Bellamy is a barrister here at 39 Essex Chambers. He has expansive arbitration practice as counsel and arbitrator in commercial and construction law. Um, his sector in experience includes construction, infrastructure, energy, joint venture disputes, sales of goods and services, insurance and reinsurance, IT contracts, information law and professional sport. And I managed to do that all in one breath, which is impressive. Um, <clears throat> he's a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and practicing international chartered arbitrator. He practices from both our London and our Singapore offices. Um, Marion Smith QC, also at 39 Essex Chambers, also specialising in commercial and construction dis disputes. She has extensive experience as counsel in adjudications, mediations before domestic courts and in international arbitrations. Um, uh, regularly appointed as a dispute resolver, sole and co-arbitrator, adjudicator and expert determinator. Fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, Vice Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, and a Vice Chair of the International Committee of the Bar Council of England and Wales. And as an added extra at the end, we have some closing remarks by a partner uh, at King and Wood Malson based in London, Wilson Antoon. Wilson is an international arbitration and cross-border litigation partner with over uh, 10 years experience acting in large-scale disputes arising out of foreign investment, commercial contracts, M&As, joint ventures, financial services, trade practices, regular regulatory investigations and fraud. So thank you very much, Wilson, for doing the uh, closing remarks at the end. Um, Wilson is qualified as a lawyer in both England and Australia. So without further ado, uh, uh, have a very interesting morning. It sounds uh, great and I'm looking forward to it. And uh, James, over to you. Thanks, Lindsay, and uh, good morning, afternoon, or evening all. Uh, Reaching the most effective outcome in any arbitration dispute, uh, whether it's in normal times or in the uh, relatively unstable times we find ourselves in now because of COVID-19, really begins with the parties' agreement to arbitrate. Now, that agreement is located in the Humble Arbitration Clause, which is essentially the parties agreeing to leave the relatively calm uh, waters of the courts and set out on the seas of party consent to a particular dispute resolution process that they define within that clause. And if parties are not using standard form drafting, um, such as in the construction industry, BIDIC or NEC, they really are setting out on fairly new and potentially unexplored orders, uh, which, uh, if I can belabor my analogy here, can often be quite rough. And why the seas of arbitration uh, so often rough? Well, in my experience, this is frequently because of a wide uh, spectrum of poor drafting and arbitration clauses. Uh, the spectrum runs the gamut from at the one end unenforceable arbitration clauses which uh, force the parties to take their disputes back to the courts or result in unnecessary and complex jurisdictional or procedural arguments before even commencing the arbitration proper in a sense subjecting the parties to disputes about their disputes and at the other end of the spectrum are arbitration clauses which force parties on a dispute resolution journey uh, or uh, voyage i suppose to continue my uh, at sea analogy uh, that is ill suited to their particular project and which results in a dispute resolution process that isn't really fit for, process, uh, for, for, for purpose. So how do we avoid disputes about disputes and uh, make an arbitration clause really work for the parties? Uh, well, the easy answer is to consult an in-house lawyer or to pick up the phone and uh, call a uh, external arbitration lawyer. But I don't think us arbitration practitioners necessarily have a cachet on drafting knowledge. And so there's some tips that I hope to impart to you all today. In that first bucket I mentioned, that is disputes about disputes or unenforceable or poorly drafted clauses, there are a few fairly easy do's and don'ts. Firstly, do use clear mandatory language in your arbitration clause and do clearly define the scope of that clause and the dispute that will be caught by it. An arbitration clause that uses permissive rather than mandatory language such as uh, disputes may be uh, referred to arbitration, may leave open the door to arguments that litigation rather than arbitration governs the dispute and parties can and in my experience have frequently spent a lot of time and money arguing over this. An arbitration clause should also be drafted widely enough to encompass all contractual disputes and if the parties so desire it, non-contractual disputes. Again, the clearer the better. Don't forget about the seat of the arbitration. 
seat of the arbitration is perhaps the part of the arbitration clause which drafters most frequently miss and is often confused with this venue or physical place. The seat, uh, conversely, is the legal or judicial place and influences a number of things, including the procedural law, supervisory courts, and the applicability of the New York Convention, which governs the enforceability of the arbitration award. So it's particularly important. This is not least because there are not insubstantial differences between seats. So failing to consider which seat to choose and to designate it clearly can cause, again, unnecessary and complicated uh, disputes. To provide for the applicable law of the contract, as well as this arbitration clause, there should always be a clear express choice of law, which should state the governing law of the contract, which determines the substantive matters of the dispute, as well as that of the arbitration clause, which is severable from the contract and uh, therefore also needs to be specified. And last but definitely not least, don't make imprecise or incorrect references to arbitration administering institutions and their rules. This is perhaps the drafting mistake that crops up the most in my experience and causes the most issues and the most potentially unenforceable clauses. Problems with drafting fit broadly into two categories. First, misnaming institutions or rules, or second, appointing one arbitral institution to administer the rules of another. In the first camp, there are a number of amusing examples that I could uh, rattle through from practice, but I invite you all to consider which institution is the Hong Kong arbitrary institution, a problem both with the wording, of course, and the precision, given that there are multiple arbitration bodies. The simplest and best answer to avoiding correct references and therefore unnecessary disputes about them is to use model clause language that all of the arbitral institutions post on the websites. Uh, and I'm happy to include links to these clauses uh, in the handout that we'll distribute after the webinar. So now that we've addressed this first bucket and we've hopefully arrived at least at an enforceable arbitration agreement, I'd like to quickly turn to how parties can avoid ill-suited disputes or perhaps better put, how they can use an arbitration clause to get the most effective outcome. Now, this will obviously differ from project to project, and therefore my advice remains as it was before, that they should, the party should seek dispute resolution uh, lawyer's advice. But I do wanna offer uh, a few quick tips that uh, some of which may be co uh, controversial, but that's half the fun of it. The first is to choose the right arbitral institution. The conventional wisdom here, increasingly, is that administering bodies are the same because of convergence in their rules. And this is to some degree correct, but there are some important differences to pull out. Most notably, in terms of their rules, uh, some arbitral institutions offer certain perks. The Singapore International Arbitration Center, for instance, uh, provides for a summary disposal mechanism uh, that allows for the prompt dismissal of unmeritorious claims, not, like, uh, not unlike in uh, court proceedings. And the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center rules provide for a similar early determination procedure. Neither of these processes are available under the London Court of International Arbitration rules or the rules of the ICC. In terms of costs, and not without wanting to name names, uh, there are not insubstantial differences between the cost of running an arbitration at some institutions with differences in case filing and registration fees, administrative fees, as well as substantially different maximums on arbitrator's fees. Arbitral institutions also have different methods of appointment and different lists of arbitrators, all of which has bearing on the pool of arbitrators from which a tribunal is appointed, where the parties have not provided otherwise in their clause or cannot agree on an arbitrator. The short point is parties should be cognizant of these differences and make an active and project appropriate choice of an arbitral institution and its rules in their clause. My second hit is that I would encourage parties to consider multi-tiered or waterfall CR clauses, which require parties to undertake pre-arbitration steps, such as negotiation or mediation. Now, these clauses are pretty well known to construction lawyers such as myself, and they're quite common in the construction and infrastructure sectors, but I personally think they're underutilized elsewhere as a way to manage parties' disputes within a set framework and avoid arbitrating disputes that could otherwise be resolved through negotiation or mediation. Now, they may not be applicable to every project or dispute, uh, particularly ones of uh, a smaller quantum, but they do pose a number of advantages, including providing the parties with an express opportunity to seek to resolve disputes in a less adversarial setting and preserve ongoing commercial relationships. 
Uh, in my experience, the specter of arbitration at the end of this process, this multi-tiered waterfall, could really serve as an incentive for parties to reach an amicable agreement at its beginning, and particularly in the current environment in which force majeure, frustration, and similar disruptive, but not necessarily project-ending disputes are occurring, having an agreed alternative dispute resolution pathway can save time and money. One quick helpful one, because I, I see I'm running uh, up to eight minutes now, it, it, on waterfall causes is that uh, parties should make sure to draft each fall in the waterfall clearly as mandatory preconditions to the following step and provide specified timing for those steps. Otherwise, the parties can find that the steps themselves are unenforceable or the parties can be left in a sort of limbo between those steps. So, pro waterfall causes, but take care of them. The third point is to specify the language of the arbitration. Uh, this is a problem that isn't seen as frequently, I think, in this neck of the woods, but certainly in my practice in Hong Kong, uh, is increasingly becoming an area of dispute uh, if the parties don't expressly provide for the language. And the position that's often adopted by the tribunal is a dual language one, which requires substantially more time and expense on the parties' behalf. Uh, language should therefore in my opinion, be always expressly provided for in the arbitration clause. The fourth is to ensure that if you have a transaction with multiple contracts, you make sure that the drafting of arbitration clauses across the suite of contracts is consistent to allow for easy consolidation of disputes as appropriate. And the fifth is to consider a sole arbitrator. Whilst the conventional wisdom is that a panel of three should be chosen to allow for party uh, choice and to avoid arbitrary decisions, a tribunal of three is substantially more expensive, and a sole arbitrator may in many instances be more suitable. Now, I think that's all the points I have time for, but I thought I'd just quickly wrap up as a last point. Um, arbitration clauses are often the last thought on parties' minds when settling their project, which is, for a variety of commercial reasons, really understandable, but significant time and expense can be spared by spending a bit of time to ensure that the humble arbitration clause is right, and I really implore you all to do so. That's it for me. I'll hand over to Pam. He's talking about arbitrators and council appointments. Thank you, James. <clears throat> uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, you have heard from James about the do's and don'ts for arbitration agreements. And now I'm going to take you to the next stage of commencement of arbitration. And I will... Uh, mainly talk about how to select counsel and how to select arbitrator. Um, as you know, unlike in court proceedings in common law jurisdictions, such as in England and Wales, Singapore and Hong Kong, where the use of counsel, i.e. barristers, in certain court proceedings is mandatory. Uh, in international arbitration, there is no mandatory requirement that parties must use barristers as their counsel. Here I'm using the term counsel very generally to refer to not only barristers, but also solicitors and other legal advisors or attorneys who appear in front of international arbitral tribunal as advocates uh, of the parties. For those who operate uh, in China mainland or Macau or other continental civil law systems, perhaps the immediate question is what exactly the difference is between barristers and other non-barrister lawyers and why do we uh, need to use barristers in international arbitration? Suffice it to say that barristers are lawyers specializing in courtroom advocacy and litigation in common law jurisdictions. They draft legal pleadings, they research the philosophy, hypotheses, and history of law, and give expert uh, legal opinions. Increasingly, parties choose to use barristers as their counsel in international arbitration. Um, it's usually seen as a significant advantage of arbitration where parties have a clear right to be represented in arbitration by party representatives of their choice, uh, from whether from inside or outside the seat of the arbitration. So for example, you can choose uh, to instruct an English barrister to be counsel in an arbitration seated in Hong Kong or Macau or Shenzhen, uh, who does not need to be qualified to practice law in Hong Kong or Macau or Shenzhen. 
Um, and for those of us who are very familiar, very comfortable about instructing counsel uh, in uh, arbitration, then we know that barristers, they are specialists and we often choose barristers who specialize in the relevant areas of law and but we use barristers for their written advocacy for their oral advocacy um, and they can help us to uh, sifting evidence that's relevant for your case and present it in the best light possible and in your best interest um, they are professionally trained to conduct cross-examination of witnesses including expert witnesses um, who are often brought in uh, on arbitrations. I would just say that perhaps most, um, one of the challenges is to identify those barristers, uh, I would say, who are fluent in international arbitration law and practices. Um, after all, in international arbitration proceedings, unlike in domestic court proceedings, you are an um, advocate in front of a very different uh, tribunal, very often uh, in front of um, international um, arbitrators who you may or may not have um, encountered uh, uh, previously. And, and of course, uh, you may have uh, instructing solicitors uh, who come from completely you know, different parts of the world with the different legal traditions. And that brings to my uh, point on the uh, co-counseling uh, in international arbitration. I think there are many uh, ample opportunities for co-counsel work in international arbitration because working together, uh, we can secure cost efficiencies and benefit from the complementary skill sets and reputations of both barristers and local lawyers. And we can uh, team up together. And I would just very quickly to sum up on the um, uh, selection of counsel, uh, see if I can make this work. I have a very short um, click, video clip to, to, sh to share. Right. Okay. So to sum up, I think that uh, when it comes to uh, select the most suitable counsel, it is a bit like uh, you know, choosing the right horses for the courses. Um, and moving on to the next part of my uh, topic, um, how to select arbitrators. Um, well, given that I am already at the mode of sharing my uh, uh, short clips, so go to the my next one choosing the oh uh, next one selecting the arbitrators so let's guess which one uh, the um, arbitrators I think it is a very risky business in my, in my experience. Uh, we are taking a chance here. Um, that's why we often hear that um, um, the arbitrators are often chosen for the wrong reasons. Um, I, I don't know whether uh, you will agree with me. Um, well, but it's usually seen as a significant advantage of arbitration where the parties have the right to participate in the appointment of the arbitral tribunal. And um, parties can appoint their own party appointee arbitrators in the case of a three member tribunal or to propose candidates to act as a sole arbitrator uh, or the presiding arbitrator. And once an arbitrator is appointed or confirmed by the relevant arbitral institutions, there are strict rules on the challenge against or removal of the arbitrator, or there's very little recourse against an award and no right of appeal generally. So getting a tribunal capable of understanding the issue is very important. And arbitrators are conducted uh, without strict rules of procedure. Uh, that's another very important difference between arbitration proceedings and court proceedings. So the arbitrator's role is not only to render an enforceable award, but also to ensure that the process uh, is 
expeditious, fair, and cost-effective. Um, so in a, uh, I think an arbitration may well turn on the quality of the arbitrators. And for this reason, choosing an arbitrator is a very critical phase of the process. Um, well, then the next question is, can you select a barrister and an arbitrator in the same chambers? And this is, of course, not a new question at all. Um, for example, the 2015 Bar Council of England and Wales have uh, published an information note uh, regarding barristers in international arbitration. And that note confirms that under English law, uh, it, the point is, well, the position still uh, as set, uh, set out in the Laker Airways case. And uh, the English Bar, uh, Bar Council recommends that the barristers and arbitrators should consider prompt disclosure of their representation for their client to the other side as soon as possible in accordance with the IBA guidelines. And then the parties will have uh, 30 days uh, to raise their objections, otherwise will be deemed to be waived. And a very thorough and convincing analysis of the relevant case authority on this topic can be found in one of uh, Michael Huang uh, C's selected essays on dispute resolution. Um, I'll, I will provide the reference uh, afterwards. So the last part of my presentation here today, um, I would just like to very quickly share with you two observations and would be very interested to hear from my panelists and uh, all the online participants, whether you will agree or not and what your thoughts are. My first observation is that um, clients in continental civil law systems tend to consider the appointment of an arbitral tribunal is more important than the selection of counsel advocates who appear in front of the arbitral tribunal on behalf of the client. And secondly, by contrast, clients in common law jurisdictions tend to consider the selection of counsel advocates is more important than the appointment of the arbitral tribunal. By way of an example, I've recently been approached by a mainland Chinese in-house lawyer for a potential appointment as an arbitrator in a shipping case. So I asked this gentleman I've never met before, I said, so which law firm or counsel that uh, your company uh, has engaged or is going to engage for this arbitration? And he told me that, well, actually, we don't want to uh, appoint any external lawyers. We only wanted to appoint an arbitrator. Uh, so, surprise, uh, perhaps this is understandable from uh, mainland Chinese uh, lawyers or a continental law, a civil law, law uh, legal system, generally speaking. The judges, arbitral tribunals are indeed the key to the outcome of the arbitration. However, uh, I believe for those who operate under common law adversarial systems, there is a tendency to find that counsel advocates are the key to the outcome of the arbitration. Um, so is it more important in international arbitration, is it more important to select the right best counsel, the advocate, or more important to appoint the right, the best arbitrator tribunal? And if, if you have a, a bet, you know, perfect uh, horse and, and jockey in mind, um, would you prefer to appoint him or her as your arbitrator or counsel in international arbitration. With this question in mind, and especially with all the uncertainties and risks involved in the selection of the jockey, the horses, and the take a chance on the arbitrators, um, I'm now going to pass the baton to Jonathan, who will guide you through how best to take control of the dispute resolution process and minimize the uncertainties and risks involved by active effective use of alternative steps to reach the best outcome without a hearing. So Jonathan, over to you. And James, thank you very much indeed for um, taking us from the start of the dispute, indeed the transaction, uh, through to the point of the notice of arbitration. I'm going to deal with the period from the notice of arbitration to the beginning of the hearing and how one can use the procedure to best advantage. I'm going to take as my um, uh, guidance the uh, words of uh, Sun Tzu um, that the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. Now, one of the points that came out of James's uh, address to you was the importance of the choice of rules, the importance of the choice of the arbitral institution. 
And by the stage that we get to, that I'm dealing with, we, the cards have been dealt. And it's a question of how you play those cards to best advantage. Likewise, looking at the points that Fan made, uh, you can choose your counsel, you can choose your solicitors, you choose your barristers, both of which have equal importance in dealing with these matters, picking up a point that Fan makes. It's also important in international arbitration to instruct counsel to have a good cultural awareness, a good understanding of the uh, background to the dispute, and not simply the hard letter black law. So what I'm going to concentrate on is how to get the best outcome in the circumstances. Now, it's important to stress that the best outcome may not be a win. Uh, in fact, quite often it is not a win, because by definition, both parties can't win. So it's playing the cards to the best advantage that you can in the circumstances. This is also not going to be a guide to the black arts of ambush techniques in arbitration. A lot of these are well known. They're almost cliches. They're often um, noted in advance by opposing parties. But perhaps more importantly, they're picked up by the arbitral tribunal themselves. And one thing that you don't want to do if you get to a hearing is have the bad reputation. It's generally a rule of decision making, uh, sitting as an arbitrator, um, and Mary and I dare say will agree with me, that by the time you get to the hearing, you've developed some sense of where the merits lie. You've developed some sense of who's telling you the truth. Now, of course, the really clever uh, operator perhaps can give that impression when not doing exactly that. But the best way to be a politician is not to appear to be a politician. And so what you need to do is to be subtle with the manipulation of these rules. Now, I'm going to give you three points to think about during this um, short um, presentation to achieve this aim. The first is to understand and use the arbitral procedure that you've got. The second is to never forget the costs implications of what you do and the relative costs consequences at the end of the day. And third, and perhaps overarchingly, um, prepare early, develop your strategy and stick to it. Because people often don't listen. They're not impressed by people who shout a lot. It's the question of people who are resilient and persevere in a firm but realistic strategy. Now on the first point, what I'm going to do is focus really on two particular aspects of procedure which can be done. There are numerous um, points that I could discuss. But first, the question of the use of an expedited procedure in appropriate circumstances. And second, as indeed um, both James and Fan touched on, the question of early determination of certain issues, fact and law. So looking at each of those, um, Nowadays, as James mentioned, many arbitral rules are converging. There's no doubt about that. Certain institutions have a reputation for leading in certain areas, and a number of those have been in Asia. But the expedited procedure is applicable in almost all um, major arbitral institutions. The Chartered Institute of Arbiters in this country has developed cost control expedited um, procedures, which, for example, includes caps on arbitral fees and also on parties' costs by reference to the value of the sum in dispute. Now, generally speaking internationally, they're set at around 2 million US dollars. Um, Hong Kong's 2 million US dollars, SIAC 6 million Singapore dollars, which is not a million miles from that. Now, the important point here is that most of the rules provide for um, mandatory or at least heavily directed reference to expedited procedure for sums below that, ICC is the same. But do not forget that it permits parties to adopt an expedited procedure um, for any sum. Um, and this is an important and interesting procedure to consider where, for example, there's a particular interest in determination within a short period of time. Now, just turning for briefly, um, to the current circumstances of COVID-19. A lot of companies are undergoing serious cash flow problems. There is concern that a number of companies may not be in existence, or at least in the same legal format of existence in a year or two's time. So 
the interest in getting an award, even perhaps not the most sophisticated, most detailed reasoned award within a period of six months can be of real interest and advantage. So there's a point um, to think about. On early determination of points, um, the origin of these rules is really um, to attract certain institutions who don't use arbitration to arbitration. Um, in particular, financial institutions operating under which to enforce guarantees and debts. Traditionally, those types of bodies have not favoured arbitration because it's felt to be less decisive than court litigation, at least in recognised court jurisdictions. Now, a number of institutions, SIAC um, in um, Rule 29, uh, HKIAC in Rule 43, <coughs> um, provide for early determination of certain issues. Now, it's important to note and to be aware that different arbitral institutions do deal with this in slightly different ways. For example, the Hong Kong rules provide that the issues capable of determination can be both of fact and of law, whereas Singapore um, limits them to legal issues. In each case, the phrase is normally a variant on the manifestly without merit. And that's a point of substantive law, which isn't for today, but is an important point to think about if you're going to go down that route. So having talked about um, procedure and the use of procedure, um, what I'm going to do now is say a few words about positioning on costs. It's an obvious point that the smaller the sum at stake, the, the relatively greater importance there is for costs. And the bigger, therefore, the converse being the bigger sum at stake, the more freedom the parties have to act in relation to costs. But in any heavy commercial or construction arbitration of the sort that we and Kingwood Mallinson undertake, costs are going to be a very important feature. And your clients are not going to thank you if you get to the end of the day and you win on a number of points, you don't win on some points and you fail to beat some form of sealed offer and suffer the consequences in costs. So do, um, do take account of what is the central, what are the central and dispositive issues in the case. Focus on those. It's very easy with long statements of case, which are currently in favor at the moment, to fail to see the wood for the trees. In fact, it's, it's a tactic used by defendants in many respects to throw up numerous issues to detract claiming parties from uh, what is really on point. So do focus on the cost aspect of everything you do. Wrapping this up then, I'm just going to say a few more words on the development of a case strategy. Um, really this is about the early instruction of um, knowledgeable, experienced solicitors and counsel. Uh, they work together, they look at the evidence, they test the evidence of their own side, and at the first opportunity, stress test the evidence of the other side. Uh, that will involve gathering factual evidence, uh, considering appropriate expert evidence, and taking a position as early as can reasonably done um, on the basis of that evidence. Dispute resolution has an aspect of game theory about it. You're considering what the other party is going to do at certain points but you can't really assess what the other party is going to do without knowing uh, what your um, cards are to play. Now, I'm not gonna try and pick up a fan's analogy of Happy Valley Racecourse. Um, it looks to me from a distance, though it's Marion out in the lead with the blue silk shirt and me following second with the horse with the sheepskin noseband. But nonetheless, employing the right counsel is important uh, in, as part of the development of the case strategy. Remember, it's not about winning uh, the battle, it's about winning the war at the end of the day. And the war might be fought out in, a, in alternative dispute resolution within alternative dispute resolution in a forum such as mediation. So that's what I wanted to say, um, uh, picking up with these points that we're running through from the cradle to the grave. And we're going to move on, not to the graveyard slot, but that would be unfair at the end of, the, uh, uh, of this presentation, but to the final, um, the crescendo uh, of our presentations, which Marion will pick up. 
Well, thank you very much. Uh, I feel that I must be the fourth singer in ABBA. Um, please put in the chat box which singer you think I am. Uh, and that's a very clumsy link to remind you all, please, would you give us some questions? Some have already come in, some came in beforehand, but it would be great to get engaged and to hear what you would like us to deal with. And if you don't want to ask a question, but make a statement again, put it through the Q&A box, but we will also monitor the chat box. Fan and Jonathan are doing it now. I'm going to group what I have to say very briefly because I am the last speaker and I'm well aware that a Zoom session, and we have to remember this when we're dealing with remote hearings, they are draining. They take far more out of the participants, both the speakers and those who are listening, than an ordinary face-to-face -face meeting. I'm going to group what I have to say under three headings. First of all, it is all about winning. And I think we just need to identify what the key factors are that lead to winning, because that will inform the steps you need to take when dealing with a remote hearing. The second point that I'm going to want to look at is to remind you that it's not one size fits all. We tend to think that there is a dichotomy. You can have face to face or you can have remote. But in fact, there are a huge number of shades in between. And we all have experience of those shades. I think there's a feeling growing that in fact remote is new. When you sit back and think about it, we have become used to a lot of the techniques that I'm going to talk about in my third section, which is all about preparation. The drama, the theatre of the warfare of litigation, I think has been affected and needs, we need to remember is affected by the use of any form of remote hearing technique. It's all about preparation. And I'm loosely going to look at technical and logistical matters and touch on legal matters and procedural arrangements. So that's the headings. The first one, let's just remind ourselves about what really matters. And let's start with arbitrators, or as Fan would have us believe, the horses for the horses. How do they reach their decision? And what is it that they are deciding? Because I think we all come into this profession thinking it's wonderful points of law, it's subtle, nuanced, legal, structured arguments. It is quite often largely about what the contract means. And I think every lawyer on this webinar will feel that they are probably the first people who've actually read the relevant contract. I'd be interested to hear if that's a view that you all share. But it's also about the facts what actually happened. And that's what your case strategy leads you to prepare. And that's what an arbitrator starts to analyze. They do it with a chronology. They always want to know what happened as time unfolded. That's the way time works. It is a linear concept as far as we're concerned. And you want to create that chronology out of the admitted facts, the unarguable facts, based on the documents and on the inferences that you can draw from that. Documents. I think we all would agree that the documents are key. We all now know that the recollection of witnesses is unreliable. The idea that a witness is a camera with a memory, with a fixed set record of what happened, has been demonstrated over and over again as not being an accurate picture to draw of the work that memory does. Memory is flexible, memory is constantly being recreated, and the process of arbitration in fact enhances that unreliability. Because we ask a witness to come back to something that they left a long time ago, to look at a statement that has quite often been prepared for them by a lawyer, a lawyer who has the benefit of hindsight, and full access to all of the documentations, we ask that witness to refresh their memory by rereading the documents, both those they saw at the time and those they didn't see. They then go over and over again. They sign, they leave the statement, they come back, they remind themselves of what it says before they go in to give the evidence. And by that stage, the memory is the memory that has been created by that process. So commercial assessors, commercial evaluators know to place the greatest stress on the documents. And I'm going to be stressing that to you as a key element when it comes to preparing for a remote hearing. 
evidence. We also know that expert evidence matters and we all know the stories of the experts who don't reappear for the afternoon session having lost their nerve and left the hearing room after the morning session. It's very simple for an expert, keep it objective. That's what the tribunal wants, nothing else. Then we also know that we have to help our course carefully selected over that winning line and we have to produce in our closing submissions the draft award. We have to have identified the key issues and we have to have given them our answer to that. Now that's key factors that affect any form of arbitration. That's how you win the hearing, you win the battle as Jonathan puts it. It doesn't change whether it's face-to-face, -face, hybrid or remote. Let's move on to my second point and just remind ourselves that we are used now already to a wide range of systems. We have probably all of us have had experience of dealing with an electronic bundle, of dealing with a witness giving evidence over live stream, of dealing with a telephone case management conference and a procedural hearing done remotely. So we've already start to learn the basics. Let's then move to the third stage and look at what in fact we should be considering. In many ways, it's incredibly simple. If you're going to have any form of remote hearing, you have to have access to good, quick, reliable internet. And we've all learnt over the last 12 weeks that we thought we did and we probably didn't. For this webinar, we logged on half an hour beforehand just to make sure that everybody was online. And it was a good thing we did. And we'd also practiced and beforehand, just again to check that everyone could operate the system. And you will have to remember that basic lesson. It can't just be assumed. The analogy of opening the arbitration door and in you walk to the hearing room doesn't apply. You're going to have to cooperate. It keeps the costs down dramatically if you do. Sometimes clients don't understand why you're cooperating with the other side, but on things such as arrangements for a hearing, I strongly recommend it. So what are you going to be cooperating about? You're going to be talking about how do you deal with failure? Because trust me, it will happen. What will, ha what will you do when the system goes wrong? What will you set up? What platform are you going to use? How are you going to arrange it? What hearing rooms are you going to have? What protocols are you going to have for failure? Are you going to record it? How many recordings are you going to allow? Who's going to have control of that recording? How do you amend the recording? What are you going to do about the transcript writers? What are you going to do about the um, interpreters? Please think carefully about the use of breakout rooms. We've had an interesting episode here with the live streaming of a case involving, I think, billions. No. Yeah, billions, billions, not millions, where comments were made about the veracity of a witness at the point when the legal team were moving from the live stream of the entire hearing into their breakout room. It shouldn't have happened. Apologies were sent into the judge. The apologies were in fact broadcast. There is anecdotally as I hear it, concerns about the integrity of that hearing room and managing the transition from the hearing room into the private room, with in fact some providers now insisting that everyone logs off and logs back in. Something for you to think about. You want to be absolutely confident that anything you're saying in a private session remains that. Organising the documentation, that is absolutely key. Everybody has to have access to the same bundles, and has to know how to arrange the same bundles. You're going to have to think about letting the witness, as they would do if it was a real hearing, turn the pages, giving them control of an electronic bundle. You're going to have to think about time zones. I've dealt with a hearing where we had participants from the west coast of the USA, London and South Korea. How do you manage all of that? It seems to me it's quite simple. What you're looking to do is to ensure that whoever is giving evidence takes priority. That that person's concerns lead, but you're going to have to be flexible. You're going to have to think about, do we sit each day at this time? Do we break it up? Do we go into the weekend? 
transparency alert, I'm about to promote to you a protocol from the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, and I am a trustee, so I would say this, wouldn't I? But a very useful guide to the things that you ought to think about is the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators Guide to Remote Hearings, and we'll put that link in the note that we send out afterwards. Two last thoughts, if I may. Legal matters. As James said, you don't want to create a dispute about a dispute. You need to consider very carefully whether or not in a domestic enforcing court, the use of remote hearings will be recognised as legitimate. Because I can see that there will be parties who take the use of a remote hearing as a grounds to challenge enforceability. You need to have thought about that, considered the position, and I would recommend that in fact there are certain stages that you ensure as far as possible that you mimic the face-to-face, -face. so you're going to try and get a signed award. Then to pick up on a question that came into the Q&A, because I think the ability to deal with remote hearings is something that arbitrators and prospective arbitrators will need to demonstrate. And the question is put in the chat box, how does an arbitrator get himself selected for assignments? What and how to mention on your CV resume? It seems to me that you, insofar as a CV and a resume is important, and we could talk about that, for some time, demonstrating that you are used and capable of using the remote methods of a hearing is important and something to think about. And I hope that I haven't taken too long and I brought that in within the time. Let me pass over now to the Q&A sessions. And I think Van and John, Jonathan, you're going to put us on the spot and ask us the questions. Oh, thank you very much indeed for um wrapping it up and dealing with the uh, ultimately the most important aspect, which is the hearing itself. So we've had a good number of questions come in and uh, I'm going to summarize um, a couple of these, cluster them together um, because several of them deal with similar sort of point. Um, first one really concerns arbitrators um, and James um, as uh, member of a law firm who has the pleasure of appointing arbitrators. Um, <clears throat> Marion has already dealt with one point about how to get appointed. But one of the questions that's come in is an interesting one and, and deal, deals with a concern on the part of the question about whether certain arbitrators are appointed too often uh, and whether or not um, there should be stricter rules in effect on that so that um, appointing parties who are regular uh, dispute um, parties don't select arbitrators with a view to getting a certain outcome. I wonder what you thought about that. Jonathan, well, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it, it is a, a very valid concern. It is somewhat mitigated by the requirement by institutions to have arbitrators sign declarations of independence and impartiality. But beyond that, obviously, the parties need to be cognizant of um, the potential for bias and uh, have at hand and readily at hand the IBA uh, guidelines on conflict. Unfortunately, this is never the full answer, of course, because as Fan pointed out earlier, it is quite hard to challenge an arbitrator once appointed, and it is the brave party indeed who does so once they have been appointed, because you don't want to challenge an arbitrator and obviously fail at it. Um, so, I, I mean, the, the, the short answer, unfortunately, is that you need to be careful and cognizant of the appointment process, ask the right questions at the right uh, points in time, make sure that you're using uh, uh, the IBA rules on conflicts uh, and, uh, you know, appreciate in part also as well that there are different cultural approaches to the appointment. It's something that Fan touched on. Uh, certainly amongst, uh, if I can term it very broadly, uh, Asian users, there is a slightly different perspective on what the role of the arbitrator is, and it's certainly more party-centric, perhaps if I can put it that way, so that needs to be thrown into the mix as well. So, oh, James, that's, that's a really interesting point. Um, I think it's probably right that different areas of the world expect different things of their appointed arbitrators. Mm. Um, and Fan, I'm just wondering whether that might be one of the reasons which um, explains the point you made, um, that in certain jurisdictions, parties think it's more important to focus on the selection of the arbitrator rather than counsel. And the old cliche about you know, a good judge, a good lawyer knows the law and an excellent lawyer knows the judge. 
um, comes to mind. Fan, what do you think about that? Is there any truth in that? Um, I, I really think that um, from my experience with um, uh, Asian, or very generally speaking, uh, Chinese clients, um, they do consider the appointment of arbitrators uh, more important than the, the roles, potential roles played by counsel. Um, I, I suspect that's because of the, um, the, um, the, the, uh, the inquisitorial uh, system that they operate in. They are used to um, consider that um, in an inquisitorial system, the, the judge or the arbitrator in arbitration, they are the decision makers and they will ask uh, the counsel to put, or the lawyers to put forward what the tribunal, what the judges consider are important, are critical uh, to the outcome of the arbitration. And I think it probably stems from that tradition. Um, on the uh, contrary, if from uh, common law jurisdictions, um, we, would, we tend to think that actually uh, in the appointment of arbitrators, the party's right is to participate in the process, but ultimately, for example, when it comes to the appointment of the sole arbitrator or the presiding arbitrator, that's not a decision that can be made uh, solely by the parties themselves. And of course, if they can agree upon, then, then, then that's an, uh, a different matter. Uh, but really, uh, from common law uh, practitioners, generally speaking, from their point of view, the selection of the council is uh, in their hands. They can choose uh, whoever they consider most um, effective, most comfortable uh, to, to work with, uh, to represent them in particular cases. Um, so I, I think this is uh, culturally, um, um, perhaps even historically, uh, a, a you know, uh, common law and continental civil law jurisdiction will have different uh, perspectives. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's, that's really interesting. Marion, um, a few of the questions that have come in cluster around a point which you've already touched on, but perhaps I could just ask you to develop a little bit more, and that's this question about due process um, and virtual hearings. Of course, we're all ultimately focused on the outcome, and, and that is not just to obtain an award, but to obtain an enforceable award if necessary. Um, and a couple of questions have specific factual um, examples given, but just given the time available more generally, what do you think are the considerations for due process? For example, if, a, if one party uh, insists on a traditional hearing, um, but the other party, perhaps most likely the claiming party, wishes to proceed without delay to a virtual hearing. Do you think the arbitrators have to um, delay or adjourn to uh, wait for um, a conventional hearing, or do you think they can proceed with a virtual hearing? And if they do do the latter, how should they do it? What I've seen in over the last 12 weeks is that at the beginning the argument was simply bleating out COVID-19. If you said COVID-19 as the reason for any submission you were about to make, the belief was that would get you home. The due process arguments have become far more sophisticated and refined over this period, the last 12 weeks, with parties understanding that you need to link that to the fundamental principle. You have, it's very simple, you have to run a fair process and you have to give the parties a reasonable opportunity to put their case. And you have to link why the pandemic means that you can't be sure that you're going to reach that outcome. I think moving forward, it's going to be harder to succeed with that sort of argument because everyone's going to be expected to have taken the steps to deal with COVID-19. I suspect that almost every arbitrator would like to engender within the parties an agreement for the process that is ultimately operated. And I think what we are seeing is the piecing together of a patchwork that works. So it's not all or nothing, that a middle ground is found that meets valid objections. So your answer, the answer to your difficult question is, as it always is for a lawyer, it, it depends, but it's nuanced. Don't think it's um, a lazy way out to get what you want. Be prepared to justify and think through against the fundamental principles why you say it should be adjourned. But I've seen we now have 
the last, the last speaker, the, the fifth member of ABBA. So I will be quiet. Well, um, Mary, thank you very much indeed. You're quite right. We're, we're going to um, stick to our time estimates. It's always something that keeps the tribunal on board. Yes. Um, Wilson, um, good to see you again. Um, and uh, hand over to you as the fifth man to uh, wrap this up. Very grateful. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, all. I'll, I'll keep my remarks very brief. Um, I'd like to thank my colleagues at King Edward Mallison's and speakers from... 39 Essex Chambers for their insightful presentations. Uh, the COVID pandemic has clearly caused significant challenges in our work and personal lives, but it's also provided us with an opportunity to reflect on the way we do business and to find ways to be even more efficient, collaborative and innovative. I think um, what we can take away from today's talk is that COVID has pushed parties and practitioners around the world to find uh, new ways to manage disputes and that, in my view, arbitration as a dispute resolution mechanism is agile and well-placed to meet, meet the challenge. So thank you once again to the speakers uh, and to the attendees. We hope you enjoyed this presentation, this webinar, and we, we do encourage you to reach out to us for any follow-up information or questions that we weren't able to answer today. Uh, thank you all and have a good day, afternoon or evening. <laughs> thank you. Right. Thanks, Carl. Well done. Thank you.